They play that in the mid-80s or not? No. Spin me right round under live, nothing? No. Well, you missed a good one, but I'm sure they played other good ones. Um, so this week, we're talking about uh, rotational motion, OK? This is the last new topic before the exam. Right? The midterm exam is next Friday. And uh, I have nothing to say about it right now, because I haven't thought about it at all, OK? Thursday, I'll tell you everything about the exam. What's on it, when it is, what time it is, what room it's in. I'll tell you everything Thursday. Right now, I know nothing. So you can ask me about the exam, but I know nothing. I know nothing about the exam. It's about physics. That's all I know. But I'll be glad Thursday we'll talk in great detail. Okay. Let's see. Any questions about the exam? OK, so up to now, up to now, what have we been doing? We've been working with bodies, right? And all the bodies we've been working with have been point particles, or point masses. Everything has been a point mass. Um, that's why when we draw our free body diagram, we just draw a little circle and put the forces on it. We don't worry about the size or the extent and all those properties. We don't worry about the orientation. But now we're going to get more realistic, or more real, as your generation would say. More real, we're going to work with, and this is the technical term, rigid bodies. All right, so what does rigid bodies mean? It means they have size and shape and direction. Not direction in the career sense, but direction means they point a specific direction. Okay, a direction in space around an axis. Okay? So that's what happens when something gets big. A point particle, you can't really say which direction it's facing. And you can't really say what its shape and size is. It doesn't have anything. It's just a point particle. But as soon as we let it be something big, suddenly it can have size, shape, and direction. We can get even more real and go to the next level. Next week is deformable bodies. Oh, that's nothing more real for me. Deformable bodies mean things so like elastic that you can stretch and expand. That's next week. We're going to spend like half a lecture on it. It's really not that important for this class. We're mostly talking about things that always uh, maintain their shape. Do you want to get even more real? I saw lots of notes. OK, so even. I, B, I, D, look it up, OK? Even, even more real is reconfigurable bodies. So you may have had a moment in high school where you asked your high school physics teacher, how is it they were able to walk? How does that work? <coughs> or why can a car go forward just using static friction? What? That doesn't make any sense. And that's because you have to go to reconfigurable bodies to be able to explain that. You have to have something that can take one part of its body and put it here, and then take this part that was behind that part and put it over here. And then this part was behind that part and put it over here. Right? That's why something can walk. You can't really explain it with this or this or this. Right? You have to go all the way to basically kinesiology. Right? So that's why we don't do lots of examples about walking and driving cars, because it's just confusing. All right? So um, here we go. Let's see. Let's think about, so for, I forgot my little pendulum. So if we imagine we have a pendulum, so the way we would have thought about a little mass on a string before, I think about the big mass that was going in a circle, our physical pendulum. Um, it went back and forth, and we didn't really think about what was really happening with the bowling ball, did we? But if we had looked at the little three fingers, wait, how many fingers are on the bowling Three? Three. If we looked at the little three fingers, they would have been tilting down here, and then when it got up to here, they would have been kind of tilting up here. Right? The bowling ball was actually rotating, because it's a real ball. It's not a point particle. So when we did all of our analysis, we said, oh, it's just a point mass. Let's just draw its free body diagram like this, and G down, and tension up, and we went to town. Okay? But in reality, everything is actually has orientation that you have to think about. It is possible to move a bowling ball in a way where it doesn't change its orientation. You could do it. But just the way things naturally move, they tend to change their orientation, which is why we have to talk about it in physics. Right? That's what rotational motion is. OK? So that's what we're doing. All right. Here we go. Here we go. 
So basically what we're going to do is go through a lot of the basic concepts of rotational motion, maybe get to a problem, and then do lots of problems on Thursday. We're gonna, I just want to go through the basics without getting too bogged down in details. Okay, so here is a very important statement. You might say, well, how is this different from kinematics, what we did already? Translational. What do we have to keep up with? Okay, I was going to draw the hands clapping emojis, but I'm not going to. Rotational. Motion. Here, you somebody clap. Two claps. Always. Requires. Thank you. Uh, an axis of rotation. You have to describe, or you have to specify the axis of rotation. Okay? Sometimes it's obvious. So sometimes you just look at it and say, where is the axis of rotation? Well, let me think. Here is a disc that we're going to spin. It's Carl Sagan. And he's spinning, and it's pretty clear what the axis of rotation is. Right? So here's the disc. Here it is. Right? And it's spinning around like that, an omega. Axis of rotation clearly is along the center. So you can tell where the axis of rotation is. And then sometimes it's less obvious. Let's think of a case where it's less obvious. I'm going to have this uh, eraser, because I forgot to get a board, fall off of this. Ready? Watch. This is big. Ready? Watch. Thank you. Now let's think about where was the axis of rotation for that motion. So here is the eraser, like that. Uh, say it's really out there, right? And it's going to start to fall down. We know it's going to fall off the edge. You just saw it. It will fall off the edge. Where is the axis of rotation? Um, is it the center? It's right here. Right, it's actually rotating right there. After it falls and it's free, it might rotate about some other axis. But while it's falling, it's here. So this is these are uh, constrained motions. So these are yeah, constrained motions. We'll talk about later when you let something rotate freely, it rotates about a specific point. But in this case, to do the problem, to actually analyze this mathematically, we would need to say this is the axis. This coming out of the board is the axis. And here's another case of less obvious, is if you have something rolling, imagine this is a wheel. Here we go. Here it goes. Let's imagine a wheel rolling forward. Right, here goes the wheel, and if the wheel is moving along, along with velocity v, we know it must be rotating like this, and some omega, if it's moving forward. So where's the axis of rotation? Uh, well, a wheel certainly looks like it's rotating here, doesn't it? I mean, it's spinning, right? it's going by, so that could be an axis of rotation. But where's it really rotating, perhaps? And what do I mean by really? What do I mean by around? Here. You could also argue it's rotating there, couldn't you? Yes. Oh, I could. You probably could. Right? So if it's going along, we say, oh, it's rotating around here. And it is. But really, if you were to stop and say, where's it really stationary? It's stationary down here. It's actually rotating around the bottom. And it's just what is the bottom keeps changing to be a different part of the mass. Right? That's part of the reconfigurable body thing. Right? So it's really, when a wheel rotates, it's rotating like this. It's not really rotating like this. Unless you want to do a different reference frame. Oh, okay. So here is for the ground frame. And the ground frame, it's rotating around the ground. Right. But you could also say, oh, no, I'm in the wheel frame. <coughs> if I'm in the wheel frame, then I'm moving with the wheel. Right? And to me, it's just rotating like this. So it depends on which frame you're in, basically. It's all relative. That's why they call it kinematics, is because everything's relative in kinematics. This other people get this anyway. Um, now we're not going to do too much uh, relative motion and uh, orientation or rotation at the same time, but you get the idea. It's not always trivial where the axis of rotation is. Okay? Everybody thinks they could find the axis of rotation. Now the other weird thing is you can actually solve it by putting the axis of rotation anywhere. The math will work out. I could put the axis of rotation right here on Pete Burns' mouth and solve that problem if I wanted to. I get the right answer. So the main point is that you don't have to have it in the right place, you just have to have it somewhere. But if you pick the right place, it'll probably be a lot easier. Okay? So we will always pick the most convenient place to put it. 
Okay. So basically, this lecture is just shouting a bunch of concepts that we'll get through, and then we'll use them. Okay. So one we shouted was the uh, that we have to have an axis rotation. Let's shout another one. Also, another important. You have to know what the center of mass is. And I will always abbreviate it COM, all caps, no dots. That's just how I roll. All caps, no dots. Um, oh, okay. Um, so let's see what that is. It's basically a point on the mass. You can do it with a disk or a square, whatever it is. There's two reasons you care. So why do you care is the weight at, at the center of mass. Okay, so all these times we're doing problems and drawing three by diagrams, and you always put the mg in the middle. Oh, well, this is why. But now we're telling you technically it is important that the mg, the weight, acts at the center of mass. And the other reason that it becomes important is three <coughs> objects rotate around their center of mass. Okay? So we're sort of contrasting that to these uh, constrained motions. Right? This has to rotate around that thing, that uh, rod, because there's like a little bearing here. It has no choice. There's actually forces on the bearing. It's not free. It's being held by the bearing. Weight, normal force, all kinds of stuff going on. This is constrained because it can't fall through the table. Normal forces are being applied. Lots of constraints are making it rotate right there until it falls off, and then it actually rotates around the center of mass. And then this is constrained, there's probably an axle here, it's touching the ground, it's friction forces, yada, yada, yada. But a free object rotates about its center of mass. Okay? So let's find the center of mass of some objects. Now let's do ones I draw. This one's too small. Or, uniform. So uniform means the mass is smoothly spread through the object. And I'm going to say, Symmetric. Is anybody going to panic if I say symmetric objects? And all I mean by that is like a nice shape. You know, let's go back to the, like the third grade or a square. Where's the center of mass? It's in the center. Let's do a circle. Where's the center of mass? It's in the center. Okay. So for just simple objects, the center of mass is pretty much where you would think it would be. Why does it make it go in the opposite? In direction opposite from the forward velocity. Uh, did I draw this wrong to see the wheel? Yeah, it's walking down. I'm sorry. I blanked on how a, a wheel works. This is hard. This is not technical. I'll tell you what is technical. Uh, center mass, uh, let's do a rod. Here we go. Like that. There's a rod. It's in the middle of a rod. Ooh, what if it's an ellipsoid like that? It's in the center. Okay? A lot of the problems you do with big objects, they're going to be symmetric. The center mass is in the center. The force of gravity acts on the center every time. Right? Mg always acts that way. Even if something else is pushing it, Mg acts at the center of mass. But now we need to be able to calculate it uh, one way, and then Thursday we'll calculate it another way. Let's say for a collection of point masses. For a collection of point masses. So let's imagine that we have an x, y axis here, and uh, remember how far away I put the I put uh, masses at one meter, right? One meter on the x and the y. So here is x and here is y, and there they are. One kilogram masses each. One meter each, basically one meter from the origin is what I mean. So if you look at that, find your power of symmetric and uniform intuition. Where do you think the center of mass is going to be? Somebody shout out a location. Where is the center of mass going to be? Well, I mean, what? The origin, right? Yeah, because it's just like this. It's all evenly distributed. Where else is it going to go? And the answer, yeah, the origin. So we haven't done anything. Right? We haven't calculated anything, have we? No. Okay, well now, what if I do this? What if I say, oh, no, 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 this one's four kilograms, and then I did some stupid stuff. This one is two kilograms, right? And that's still one, and that's still one. 
Let's actually solve that problem. So you could probably still apply your powers of intuition and figure out which way it's going to be driven. The center mass will be driven towards the mass. It's basically the mass weighted position. So it's probably going to move up here somewhere. We put more mass up there, the center mass is going to move up there. Fortunately, there's a formula. Let's use the formula. So in a Cartesian system with just a bunch of point masses, you just find the x position, and you find the y position, and you do it separate, and everything's fine. So the x position for the center of mass is a 1 over the total mass of the sum of each mass times its x position. It sounds complicated. It's just really it's a simple idea. Let's call them 1, 2, 3, and 4. So this one would be, uh, it's x, but it's 4 kilograms times what is its x position? 0, not 1. We're doing x times 0. 2 kilograms times expect x position. 1, 3, oh, no, uh, 4, 2, plus uh, 1 kilogram. Oh, sorry, I can't read that. I'm trying to write there. 1 kilogram. What's its x position? 0 plus 1 kilogram. Its x position is negative 1. Yes, you put in the negative. So basically, you add up each one's contribution to x center mass, and then you divide by the total mass. So if you add these up, you see that's nothing, that's nothing. This is positive 2 minus 1. So the answer is 1 kilogram meter. Uh, 1 kilogram meter, if we did a unit, makes it 1. Over the total mass, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Over 8. All right? Sorry, this is messy. So x. Center of mass is 0.125. Okay, so how do I get rid of the kilograms? So we ended up with something in kilogram meters, one kilogram meter divided by kilograms. So you cancel them out, and it's 0.125 meters. So you don't know where it is on Y yet, but it's definitely over by 0.125 meters, a quarter of a meter that way. That's how that works. <laughs> Let's do Y. Real quick, so YCM, and I'll write out the formula for you if you want to see it. I didn't want to write it at first because you'll panic when you see that. Oh my god! I equal 1 to the number of masses. So you're adding up all the masses, and each mass, you're taking its Y position times how much, it, how much mass it has. That's what we just did up there. Let's go ahead and do it for the Y. Though. Let's do the whole thing. 1 over, apparently it's 8 kilograms. And now we just do it for the one. The first one is 4 times 1. Okay? The second one is 2 times 0. It has no y. The next one is 1 times negative 1, plus the last one is 1 times 0. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So the masses 2 and 4 have no y position. They don't count. You know, 4 at 1, 1 at minus 1, 4 minus 1 is 3. Um, uh, my notes are wrong. Let's see. Four. Oh no, I put a two. Uh, no, it was two. two one. Yeah, my notes are just wrong. So it's uh, three kilogram meters over eight kilograms. It's 0.375 meters, right? Three eighths. So now we have the X CM position and the Y COM. I somehow don't know. And then you can actually say, this is exactly where it is. It's about right an eighth forward and three eighths up. It's like around right there. There's the center of the mass. You just found it. Ta-da! In X and Y. We could even do Z if we wanted to. Right? We could even go into four dimensions and do time. No, it wasn't. Right. We could do 26 dimensions and pretend string theory is real. Um, we could also turn that into an integral, but let's not. I'll save that for Thursday so you can get excited about it. Let's do that Thursday. But for now, that's the basic idea. So what you can see is that uh, the mass, the center mass is driven where there's a lot of mass. So where is the center mass of this hula hoop? Uh, where is it? And I promise I would hula hoop for you, but it's a kid's hula hoop and it's too small, I can't do it. I tried back there a long time. Um, it doesn't weigh enough. Where's the center mass of the hula hoop? It's 
it's not in the thing. It's like out in space. So can the center of mass be out in space? Yeah. It is right here, right? So the center of mass is inside of the mass. It's not in the thing here. And we said free objects rotate about their center of mass. So if I throw it, and I just realized there's weights in it, so they probably don't weigh enough to make a difference. Oh, there we go. So this thing rotated, thank you very much, around its center of mass. That was an accident. Okay. <laughs> Do that again. Um, so this thing was spinning as I threw it, but you can see it was spinning around the center of mass. It wasn't spinning any weird way like that. It's shimmying because it has weight in it. Here's a hammer, right? So this hammer's center of mass is way over here, right? Because this is really heavy, this is really light. You can also find it by balancing it. Things balance at the center of mass will do that third. Center of mass is way over here, so I'm going to throw it and spin it. And watch the red thing. It's going to spin around the red part like that. See? See how it's spun around the red part? I wanted a new surface. So it's going to spin again right around the right around where the red part is. So it really does rotate around center mass. And also where the weight is applied is right at the red spot on that hammer. And the mat, the, the weight on this, you would actually have to imagine applying it where there is no mass. Okay, so weird concept we're shouting at you, that's two. You have to have a rotation axis, you have to look at center masses, and there's one more, one more weird concept to shout at you. Um, one more weird concept, that is, we gotta ask ourselves the following question. What creates Rotational motion. So just ponder that while I read this question. What makes rotational motion? Where does it come from? I do not know if there's class speaking. I don't think there is, but uh, don't quote me. Uh, let's see. So you might be saying, well, we made something turn, and it must have been that centri centripetal force, right? That, that was the centripetal force. Let's think back to uniform circular motion, and let's think about that. Uniform circular, that's the closest we've done to rotational motion, and it required what, these sentences are too long, required a centripetal force to make centripetal acceleration. But did the centripetal force really make the motion happen? It really didn't, right? So when this, bowling ball was here, and I wanted to make it go in a circle. What did I, did I just, the, the tension was there, the force was there, the tension component that was the centripetal force was there, but if I just let it go, was it gonna go in a circle? No, if I let it go, it's gonna swing that way, like that, big pendulum, like a Foucault pendulum. Who's been to the Houston Museum of Natural Science and seen the Foucault pendulum? It's fake, it really is. You ever wonder why it goes all day? <laughs> yeah, it's fake. Foucault pendulums and museums are all fake, I hate the first one. Uh, oh, that's not me, okay. <laughs> so I had to push sideways. The centripetal force wasn't enough to make it go around. So a centripetal force uh, maintains, it maintains circular motion. I did a video at that museum, and I didn't know they were fake yet. And they, we did a video of the thing moving, and I said, well, I want to see the mechanism up top. So we went upstairs and we shot it from a pie and saw it go around. I said, no, I want to see like the mechanism. You couldn't see it. It went off into the ceiling into a hole. And I could see there's like a service elevator. And the guy's like, well, you know, there's an elevator to get up there for maintenance, but it's real tight, it's hard to get into. I'm like, well, that's okay. I'll just like take a picture with my phone. I want to see it. And I started to go there. He literally went, no, no, you can't go. You can't go. And now he works here. He, he works at Rice and he did this for um, Maintain for a little so if it's not centripetal force, what is it? It's torque. Right. Torque is a push or a pull around an axis. And every case of making something turn, I can't, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I've applied a torque. When I made the bowling ball go in a circle, I applied a torque. When I spin this thing, I apply a torque around the axis. When I spin Carl Sagan here, this disc, I apply a torque, my hero. When I spin 
of this, I have, like, if I just sit there and look at it, gravity is pulling it because he's missing now. But torque, I have to apply a force around the axis. <laughs> Simpson said he would accept them here, and just great uh, benevolence. So at the break, not now, put them there, or after class, put them there. So you turn it here, or you have until noon to turn them into the box, okay? So push or pull around an axis. Um, you must, now let's have some more technical definitions of it. I'm giving you guys so much food for thought today. Okay. So for example, it's a rotating disc, which now I'm not even going to touch. I'm not going anywhere near it. It's a museum piece now. It's a rotating disc. It has radius r, and it's forced to rotate about this axis. Okay? So we've got to define an axis rotation. There it is. I apply a force with my finger. I push it very gently. You have to push it away from the axis of rotation and perpendicular. So you must push a torque the push on the disc perpendicular to the radius vector, I'll say. We'll get into exactly what that little r is when we start calculating a lot of torques. Okay? But it's a push perpendicular. You can imagine what the radius vector is. It's a vector from the axis of rotation to where I'm applying the force. So if I apply a force like this, it's not going to rotate. That would be parallel to the radius axis. Radial axis to the ground. I have to apply perpendicular. Just imagine. Imagine it going. Okay. So if we want to know the formula then, we would say the torque. I always want torque. And I try to make torque one syllable, but I did grow up in Texas, so I apologize. It is only one syllable technically. But sometimes I say power. It's R F sine theta. Okay? Rf sine theta, um, or it's sometimes written this way, Rf perpendicular. So these are basically tricky non-vector ways to talk about a cross product. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to use both of those as we go. I'll talk about what theta means, f perpendicular. Right now I just want to tell you that. I want to tell you the unit. The unit must be, what must the unit be? Uh, Newton meters. It has no name. It hasn't been named after anyone yet. And some of you I know as high school physics, you're saying, wait a minute, that's a jewel. That's already a jewel. Maybe rotation, torque, and energy are the same thing. They're not the same thing, it's the same unit. Okay, calm down. Okay. Now you're thinking, well, but maybe deep down about the plane that they are, I'm gonna win the Nobel Prize. You're not gonna win the Nobel Prize. They're not the same thing. It's a coincidence. All we have is kilogram, meters, and seconds, and we gotta make like 50 units. So some of them are going to match, okay? So torque and joules are, and joules are not the same thing. Uh, do we print the exam sheet? Or do we, uh, what? Do we need to print out the sheet with a problem on it for the Clint problem? Dr. Stinson, what do you think? You don't need to turn in the, the question sheet for the Clint problem. You can turn your work if you want. Okay, let's calculate. 
your way to court. Clearly, we need that to be able to think about circular motion. <coughs> step one, I bet you can guess what step one is. ID and axis of rotation. Does it need to be the axis the object is actually going to rotate about in your reference frame? Technically, no. But if you want the problem to make any sense, then yes. So figure out what axis you're rotating around. Okay? Step two. Uh, we're going to do this for something I won't even think about setting up at this point. Is this disk has some radius, it has some mass, and we can tie a string around it and just hang, uh, hang a weight off the string like that. And the disk is pinned here, or it's got a lot of bearing there, and this has mass m. So you can imagine what happens is the weight pulls it down and makes a step. Okay, so that's the torque we're going to start out thinking about. So the step two is draw R from the axis to the point force supply. Draw R, that's the R vector I was talking about up there, from axis to the point, the force is going to fly. So we say, okay, the axis of this rotation is like this. Where is the force being applied to the disk? Because think about that a little bit. You might say the force being applied here. That's where the force is being applied to the mass. But we know that results in tension here, and the tension applies the force to the disk. And if you don't know, I'm going to tell you, the tension, a string wrapped around a disk applies a force to it at the point it leaves the disk and the direction of the string. So the force is being applied here, like that. So that is what I want to call it. I'm just going to call it. Oh, it's not equal to mg because it's falling. Crap. But I'm going to, uh, oh, I'm going to call it F. Very creative. Thank you. Um, so we got a force down. And now you can see, suddenly, it's important that this is not a force particle. Because we have to draw a vector, r, from the axis to the point the force is applied. It's like the force is being applied at a specific place on the object. And that's because we're doing rigid bodies now that have a size. <coughs> so that's why we can't just say, oh, let's look at that. We have to actually think about where the force is being applied. Uh, three. Step three is draw the force. So I did that. So right now, it's just a little, uh, you know, a tension force from the string. Okay, so I drew the force in the right place, you know, where it goes, like that, that was wonderful. And then four is find the angle, that's not the angle, the angle theta between R and F, like that. And in parentheses, I'll put tail to tail. When you add vectors, you add them head to tail. But when you're asking for the angle between two vectors, you do it tail to tail. <coughs> and I'm going to give you just drama of how to do that. Through the so think about that. All right, so polls everywhere is added competitions now. Oh boy, we're all going to compete. So, uh, you know, if this works out, maybe we'll do it every now and then to study, to prepare for exams. Because you know the hardest part of the exam is the multiple choice, and you got to do it so fast, that's what's so hard. you got to immediately know the answer, multiple choice. So you got to get all your time to the free response. So here we go. Physics 1.0, let her know. Maybe the greatest thing ever. We may never talk about it again. Here we go. I've never used it before. Oh, it needs music. It needs music so bad. Are you ready? A block slides along the table. Which way the connect friction push the table? 12 seconds, 11, 10. Push way. Six. Oh, time's up. Oh, opposite the block direction. Oh, the correct answer is along the block direction. Leaderboard. Benedictus got it the fastest. All right.
Okay, this is not really in the course material, but just for fun. If you drill a hole in the center of the earth and drop something, it will go all the way through or stop at the center. Okay, you have no way to be able to do that. I just thought some of you might know that from general knowledge. No, general knowledge. I also want to make sure somebody knows. And it actually will go all the way through. So the proper theta here, so what is the magnitude of, of R vector? 
It's not just R. What is the magnitude? It's big R. So typically, you'll plug in something from your problem there. The length of a rod, half the length of a rod, the radius of something, the number, if they gave you the number. F, you'd probably get F for the problem. In my notes, I was silly and put MG, but it's not MG because the thing is accelerating. Oops. Uh, sorry. So we're just going to say it's F. Well, we can say it's T. It is the tension. There you go. The force would be the tension in the string, which would not be MG. It'd be lower because it's accelerating. So RT. And then what is this theta? Due to the problem, it's 90 degrees. Right? So the string will separate from the pulley right at this point based on the geometry of a, of a ten of If the line is tangent right there, it'll be 90 degrees. This will be straight down. This will be straight over. Most things will be based on more solid geometry than that. But you just have to believe me, this is 90 degrees. But it's negative 90 degrees. The order actually matters, R to F. You go from R and you go to F. And if I go from R to F, I'm going clockwise. Clockwise is negative. This is theta equals 0. This is theta equals negative 90. So sine of negative 90. So what we find is the torque is minus R T sine theta, or sine of negative 90 is negative 1. So it's minus r times t is the torque. You can also do it, though, with this other uh, uh, way, this, um, where did I write it? Up here, rf perpendicular. Okay, so you can also, in this way, I don't know mathematically what it really means. So rf side better, or r f perpendicular. I mean, it really means the same thing. We're not doing anything uh, different. Um, this R, this is the magnitude. The R is the magnitude. This is the F component uh, perpendicular to R, vector. That's what those two symbols are. So basically, when you find a component, you're just doing F sine theta in one step. Sometimes, when you look at a problem, it's easier to see that, OK? Um, what is the second T? Uh, this is a tension. I just said, oh, well, the force is really the tension. I was going to call it F, but I was supposed to call it a T. Yeah, I'm sorry. So that's the tension. Um, let's see. So we say, okay, the magnitude of R, the R vector, is big R. Right? That's the, the radius that you were given in the problem. Force perpendicular is you just look at the problem and say, can I calculate the component of this force vector perpendicular to this vector? Well, in this case, yeah, it's, the, it's all perpendicular to that vector. There's no trig to do, right? It's just F, or it's just T. You know, we have to think about the side theta because you know it's at 90 degrees in that direction. You could say, okay, then that's easier, right? And just say, oh, well, it's just T, right? Because it's all perpendicular in this case. We'll do cases where it's not all perpendicular, but in this case, it's all perpendicular. But if you do it this way, you may not get the sign right. The sign isn't done for you, OK? If you do it this way and make your sign magnet, your sign thing proper, the sign will be right. If you do it this way, you kind of have to give it the sign yourself. So we've got to remember, what does the sign mean? So here I know that it's going to be negative. And the way you know is the sign, uh, the torque, Sign goes, oh crud, I didn't write this ahead of time, with, can spell, the direction it pushes. That's not bad for the top of my head. Oh, it's pretty bad. The torque sign, I would say, is the direction that it pushes. So, which way is this thing going to turn if it's free to turn under the torque? It's going to turn clockwise. Clockwise is the negative direction. That's why when we put in the sign negative theta, negative 90, we've got a negative sign. So this negative sign means, because these are magnitudes, these are positive, this negative sign means this torque is making it turn clockwise. And when you calculate RT here, if you do it this way, you have to say at the end, OK, now, which way is the torque going to make it turn? It's going to make it turn clockwise, so I better add a negative. One way or another, the negative has to come out, because the negative tells you which way it's going to turn. Uh, let's see. Okay. So 
So let's see, our next example of calculating a score is opening a door. That's really boring. Now let's, I guess, the door is not exciting. Let's move on to the exciting one. That's more interesting.
And the question, there was a good question there. Lost it. Oh, sorry. Uh, would it still roll in the picture? Well, it's not going to roll. We don't want it to roll. So it's just sitting there, my finger is holding it up. So with or without friction, it's not going to roll. The balance of the forces can make this out of friction zero, but I just say it's frictionless, it's easier to say that. Because we're really just wanting to think about this for situation. So with no friction, frictionless thing, I could make this happen. This would happen. There's still a normal force. Push is this way, gravity's that way, normal force, gravity cancels, etc. It sits still. Okay. That was all just to see those three forces. So there's really only three forces. Right? Take away these components, they're just components of Mg. It's Mg straight down, force of the push and the normal force. So now what I want to do is calculate the torque of each force, right? So what are the torques? There's more than one. So let's look at the torque due to the normal force. Why not? Torque due to the normal force. Well, step one, draw the R vector from the rotation axis to the point the force is applied. Take your pencil and put it on the rotation axis. I literally have to hold people's hands literally sometimes in office hours. I'm like, take your pencil and put it on this point. When we get to cross products, that happens a lot. I have sanitizer, don't worry. Okay. Let's all take our pencil and put it on the axis, rotation axis. Now let's draw an R vector to the point that the normal force is applied. I don't know what to do. Look, it's in the point right here. Okay? So R is zero. Okay? I can't draw it. Ah! <laughs> if that happens to you, that means it's zero. Okay? R is zero. So the torque but the normal force is zero, okay? So if a force is applied at the rotation axis, it creates no torque. You can use this to your advantage by picking an axis to eliminate one of the forces if you're in that free range situation that you're working with, okay? So that torque is zero because the force is applied at the axis. And that's the only one that's applied at the axis. Remember, the free body diagram is not accurate. This is just where the force is, which way the force is. We've got to look at this to figure out where things are applied. Okay, Mg. Okay, step one. Draw the R vector from the point the force is applied, I'm sorry, from the rotation axis to the point the force is applied. Where is the force applied? Here, at the center of mass. And that's what we have to talk about, center of mass. Center of mass is at the center. So here is our R vector. That is not the universal R vector for everything you're going to do all year. That is the R vector for finding the torque for Mg on this wheel going down that way with a finger on it. Okay, so don't think that's some universal R. Why is it the wrong way? Right? It's just for this problem. Access to the point force is applied. Then draw the force vector. It's down like that. Uh, Mg. They look like that. Then, I said, when I think about the angle between them, it's good to draw them tail to tail, and it's good to get off the diagram because it's too complicated. And to say, I want R like that, and MG like that, tail to tail. Whoa, look at that. Now we gotta get the torque from that. Torque is R magnitude is, big R. The force magnitude is mg. That's the sign of theta. This is where the angles get confusing, okay? So as I said, the general formula is a sign of theta. So will that theta be the theta they give you every time? No. All right, so sometimes you call two things theta and you mean different things and you keep them straight in your head. And you're gonna get good at that. We could start calling everything phi, but it gets confusing. It's more confusing to call everything theta. It's less confusing to call everything theta, believe it or not. The point is you gotta know I don't just stick theta here. I say no, this theta is this angle from here to here. Okay? So you say, what is that angle? Well, uh, what is it? Well, I know that this angle is theta because I'm good at angles. Okay? If you look, you do this angle is theta, so you bring this up here, the law of crossing angles over the BS angles, right? So that's theta. So you really know that this is 180 minus theta. 
degrees minus, oh no, actually, oh my god, it's uh, minus 180 plus theta. Technically is what it is. Uh, how do I know that? I don't know. Yeah, it just is. Uh, I forgot. I have a way to explain that. I forgot which one. If you do 180 minus theta, you'll also get the right answer. So that's okay. uh, but if you go onto Google and type in, oh my god, I need a sign, don't I? If you type in sine of minus pi plus x, it'll tell you the answer is just minus sine of x. Sine of minus 180 plus theta. Uh, so, so this is just minus sine of theta. So equals minus r m g sine theta. So if you mistakenly just plug your theta in here, you'd get the right magnitude, and hopefully you'd get the direction, because you'd say, okay, which way is this going to cause it to turn? Do I need a negative sign? Well, let's see. Think about it, if it's on this axis, and this thing is pulling kind of like that, it's going to cause it to turn clockwise. Yes, it should be negative. Okay. So if you're not good at figuring this out, just put in the magnitude of the angle, and uh, get the direction yourself. Um, or we could do the perpendicular component, couldn't we? We could. We could say, no, 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 let's just do RF perpendicular. R is just R. Remember, R was just the magnitude of R. F perpendicular was what? It was the component of the force that's perpendicular to the radius vector. Well, the radius is the R vector. R is along the direction of the normal. Right? So it's the component perpendicular to the normal. And there's theta. So it was the sine. Oh yeah, the sign. It's the SI. What about the SIG? Oh well, it's going to make it go clockwise, so there's a negative there. Okay, so you get the same thing from the R F perpendicular. MG sine theta. So whichever one of those made more sense to you, do. If neither one made any sense, pop us out. Let's do it. I will literally hold your hand until it makes sense. Where are we? Latex gloves. Makes you more comfortable. Uh, now let's do the push force, FP. That's my hand pushing on it. What is that tower? This one is a little weird. It's about to get weird. Let's see. It's basically, let's go to our diagram here, and it's this vector. And then where is the R vector now? Uh oh. It's from. Where it's applied over to where the I'm sorry, where the axis where the force is applied. Look at that, it's not even a radial vector for the circle. Most problems you do is just going to be the radius vector of the circle. It's not this time. So I would say that sort of merits a new drawing. Okay, let's draw that again because by now that's such a mess. Okay, look at it. Let's draw it again. Let's say, okay, that was like that. Is it horizontal? Well, it happens to be horizontal because of the way I drew this at 45 degrees. It's not horizontal, necessarily. And then the force push is like that, right? Right along the center. Why is it waiting minus theta? Uh, I forgot. I, I had 180 minus theta and I decided it wasn't. Uh, it gets into theta being theta final minus theta initial. It's not worth it. We can have lunch and talk about it. It's not worth it right now. Um, let's see. So what we got to do is just say, well, this is panic-inducing. I agree. So let's just apply our rules. Let's just say the torque due to the push is uh, R times F, the magnitude R to the magnitude F, and the sine of the angle between them. Okay. What's the magnitude of R? Uh, uh, it's not the radius of the circle anymore, is it? Oh my god, I had to draw a circle to figure this out. I was like, well, let's see, there's the center. And now let's look at it straight up like that. We're applying FP here, along the thing, up the thing. Well, we know that's R. And we know that's R. And we know this is actually the other side of the right triangle. So it's a square root of 2R. You would work that out. So there's a little bit of geometry here. We don't usually have that much. But there's the magnitude of that vector. Just a little bit of geometry. I hope that's right, because I just, I've never seen that before. Pretty sure that's right. I prefer just to read from the book. Sometimes I have to go, you know, actually do physics. Um, and what's the force? 
Uh, this is one where we were just given the magnitude of FP. Actually, we can find it when we're done. Uh, FP. And it's sine of the angle between them. So I would probably draw these um, like that. FP and then R is kind of like, well, if we draw it this way, well, kind of like that. And how did I know that it's 135 degrees is because it's 90 plus 45. This is 90 and this is 45. So R and FP, and I'll show it better in a second, is the sine of 135. Okay. Hold on. Isn't that assuming that it is 45 degrees for, yeah, I assumed it was 45 degrees because it is 45 degrees. Because in the problem we said along the center. It's actually important that this gets applied along the center of the thing because of the friction part. So those of you asking about friction, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about what I'm about to say. But if you're asking about friction, if this is frictionless, why is it stable? If I had my finger up here, it wouldn't be roll. Right? But if I put my finger right there, then everything balances. So I put it there on purpose. So that is 45. So since that's 45, this becomes 45. Let's see, there's that, that way, and then it makes a right triangle. So we know that um, when this comes here and that goes there, it, it just, it's 45. I can't, I can't do the geometric proof. And this one is much deeper in geometry than I need to do. Okay. So the sine of 35 is squared over 2. R, F, P, squared of 2 over 2. And you see that, um, uh, let's see, you see that it's all canceled. Square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. So you get that this is equal to RFP. Positive. Is that correct? Is it positive? Yes, because what's the push going to tend to do? It's going to tend to rotate it counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. Okay, so that's exciting. So now what are we going to do? What are we done? Uh, does that mean the theta for the torque mg? No. Okay, so this is theta. This thing could have been at 10 degrees. What made this 45, and I'm, just, I'm not going to struggle to do the geometry clearly for 10 minutes, it's not worth it. But what made this 45 has nothing to do with theta. It has to do with the fact that I applied a force along the line that goes to the center of the circle. So think about this later. All right. I applied that, and this vector is like that, and all is in the perpendicular and parallel system. This whole thing, if it came down, if theta changed, this would still be 45 degrees. It has nothing to do with theta. I know, the jump is a little heavy on this. But here's the cool part. We know FP. If the thing's not going to move, we know FP is mg sine theta. Equals R mg sine theta. And it's positive. And over here, we had negative R mg sine theta. Here we have zero. So what is the sum of the torques? Zero, right? Zero plus negative RMG sine theta plus positive RMG sine theta, and these cancel, and the whole torque is zero. And torque makes something turn, so I'm jumping ahead as we the second law, but now you can tell the sum of the torques is zero, it's probably not going to turn, it's not going to move. And yeah, this is a static situation, we said that we're pointing. So this was one with numbers, you could be pointing at numbers, we could say, you know, What's the magnitude of the mg torque and the push torque to be equal? The magnitude to be equal to be opposite. So that was a complicated version where everything's not just a right. So you can see probably the hardest part of these torque calculations is drawing these two vectors tail to tail and figuring out the angle between them. That's that's a tricky. Let's see. Okay. So now that we have all of that. We have all of that. I'm just going to state Newton's second law of translation. Then we set, and I'll demo it for you. Okay, so now we have all the elements we need to do dynamics. Now we can do Newton's second law for rotation. Is there another set of laws? Oh, it's the same one. We can generalize it, don't worry about it. But before, oh no, we don't have a routine.
before we had some of the forces in MA. Sum of the torques is something times the angular acceleration. So let's think about the units. This was a torque was a newton meter, right? Not a joule, a newton meter. What's the unit of angular acceleration? It's radians per second squared. Are radians real? No. Right, so it must be, this is kilogram meter squared per second squared. And what is that? That's second squared on the bottom. So the unit here must be kilogram meter. Or those units are the same, right? So kilogram meter squared. So whatever this is, it's not the mass. It's not the mass. If you put the mass there, the units don't work out. So it's something else. It's the moment of inertia. All right, so. Uh, so I'm going to read you this next time if I is the moment of inertia. And we're going to have to talk about what that means. Okay. Okay. That's good. There's no point in starting.